This is the day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Welcome. Welcome to worship as we live stream from the sanctuary of East Liberty Presbyterian Church over Facebook and YouTube and have some folks who have called in over Zoom. We gather, although there are no congregants worshiping here in the pews, um, I, am gather, I am joined here by Dr. Ed Moore, by our soloist Todd, and by Tim and Wayne and Matt running the tech in the balcony. But we continue to worship a God of spirit and of truth. We are reminded as we gather in this space of the saints of God throughout the ages, and we celebrate the Noden family today who's, uh, who have been honored by these flowers present in our sanctuary. So we remember George and Norma Noden, and we remember Gail Noden. Um, Gail's daughter, Tamara, have, has provided these flowers with us in honor of her mom's birthday, and we remember with joy these saints of Christ. As we continue our time together, we are reminded that there continues to be a lot going on in the life of our family of faith, even though our worship and ministry remains virtual at this time. Unfortunately, the first announcement I have is a reminder to look out for scams. We are continuing to um, be made known that, uh, be made aware of emails and texts being sent out to members of our congregation on behalf of the Reverend Randall Bush. Um, seeking that gift cards would be um, quickly bought and given to him. Um, those, that is not a request that comes from Pastor Randy. Please let us know if you receive such a message and know that we would never ask you to um, quickly run out and purchase gift cards because all of the pastors are too busy praying. Um, we are grateful for our shared ministry together, but this is not the way in which we all work together. Yet, we will invite you to participate in the Giving Tree Ministry, sponsored by our deacons, as this is not a season in which we can go forth and buy gifts from stores and wrap them and deliver them to families' homes. We are asking um, that you go through the Giving Tree website um, and donate um, a 25 gift card or more to make, or to make a donation in any amount to support um, the church purchasing Christmas gifts for children in our community on behalf of our congregation, EECM, Hope Academy, and some other ministry partners. And so you can read more about that opportunity to serve that is being sponsored by our deacons. Um, uh, read more about it on our website. You will also note that our Tuesday evening meditation group that is a bilingual meditation group called Refuge of the Heart will continue this Tuesday. Um, you are welcome to join. Uh, the, the meditation will be offered in both Spanish and English and there's a time of prayer together. So you can see the Zoom information on your screen. Please join um, Pastor BJ and our seminary intern Catherine for that time of prayer. You also note that Presbyterian women are holding their Bible study as we approach the first week of December. So Tuesday, December 1st, there will be their morning Bible study, and Monday the 7th, their evening Bible study. Um, the details for that Zoom gathering are, can be obtained by emailing pw.elpc at gmail.com. There's other, an invitation um, that I'd like to extend on behalf of the Faith Formation Board as Advent begins next Sunday. We um, have provided a gift to all families of ELPC um, so that we might continue to celebrate this Advent season together through a range of spiritual practices in community, even though we cannot gather in the church building itself. We have Advent gift boxes available, one for each home. They include candles so that you can make your own Advent wreath, um, opportunities to bake pizza, a devotional book, different crafts, um, a scavenger hunt uh, of items that you will need if you would like to participate in our church Christmas pageant being held in a few weeks. We will also be handing out the handheld candles that we use during the singing of Silent Night during our Christmas Eve services. You can pick those up following this service at 12.30 today, anytime before 2.30 p.m. And again, next Sunday from 12.30 to 2. 
If you are not able to pick it up during those times, or if you're not able to get to the church to pick it up, please contact Megan Leischer, and um, her contact information is on the slide, and she and the Faith Formation board members will be happy to assist you. We also know that this week marks a holiday in the life of our or of our nation, it's uh, Thanksgiving, a time to give, reflect upon and give thanks for all for which we are grateful. There is a community interfaith service being held on November 24th. You can read more about it through the Facebook um, notice through Third Prez Church. The information is on your screen. Also, our Young Adult Ministries is very busy during this season. Um, and so if you would like to participate in our young adult ministry, there is a notice on the slide about how you can text YAM um, to the number on the slide. I am not a young adult anymore, and so my contacts cannot see that far away very clearly. Um, but you should be able to see it at home, and you can uh, reach out, and Kelly Boer will be able to give you information about upcoming events, uh, many of which are occurring several, uh, several times throughout the month. So please sign up and learn more about what the YAMs are doing this season. We also give thanks to our facility staff. Um, we couldn't even be present in the building with such a small group if our facility staff were not able to keep the building clean and operational through this extended season. And so we give thanks um, for all of the facility staff and for their service um, throughout um, this odd season in our life and ministry together. We're grateful for all they do to um, make sure that temperatures are taken upon entry of the building and that the building is also safe and sanitized for those who are present in the building. And finally, we do give thanks for our stream team and for the ways in which Tim and Wayne help us to connect with our congregation so that we might continue to worship together as God's people. There's a lot more going on. I commend to you our newsletter or our website so that you might um, read more about all of the ways in which you can participate in the ministries of our family of faith. That being said, friends, we need a reminder of God's peace. We need to trust that God is with us always. And so friends, la paz de Cristo esté con ustedes, the peace of Christ be with you. Let us worship God together. We worship a God whose power is love, who, who raised Jesus from death to life. We pray that God will free the world to rejoice in Christ's peace, glory, and his justice, and live in his love. May all people of earth, divided and enslaved by sin, be freed and brought together under Christ's gentle and loving rule. May your kingdom come, we pray. Let us worship God. Light this candle to remind us that God is with us. of Christ. 
Let us now turn our hearts to prayer and confess our sin to God. Holy God, we confess that we have sinned against you and against our neighbors. We confess that we have not done what you have called us to do, and we have done what you have called us away from. We have been unfaithful to you and your commandments. You, God, are slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love. Yet we are quick to sin, slow to forgive, and fill our lives with things that seem to distract us from you rather than bring us closer to you. Merciful God, help us to be more like you. You continue to bless us, yet we often miss our opportunities to be a blessing to others. Have mercy on us. We pray for your forgiveness. May we work faithfully to love you better each day. Fill us with your grace so that through you, we may be vessels of your love and peace in the world. Amen. The scripture assures us that God will forgive our sins. God is merciful and gracious and forgiving. So too may we be with one another. Hear the good news. In Jesus Christ, we are forgiven. Praise God. Good morning. A reading from the book of Ezekiel, chapter 34, verses 11 to 24. God, the true shepherd. For thus says the Lord God, I myself will search for my sheep and will seek them out. As shepherds seek out their flocks, when they are among their scattered sheep, so I will seek out my sheep. I will rescue them from all the places to which they have been scattered on a day of clouds and thick darkness. I will bring them out from the peoples and gather them from the countries and will bring them into their own land. And I will feed them on the mountains of Israel by the water courses and in all the inhabited parts of the land. I will feed them with good pasture and the mountain heights of Israel shall be their pasture. There they shall lie down in good grazing land and they shall feed on rich pasture on the mountains of Israel. I myself will be the shepherd of my sheep and I will make them lie down, says the Lord God. I will seek the loss, and I will bring back the strayed, and I will bind up the injured, and I will strengthen the weak. But the fat and the strong I will destroy. I will feed them with justice. As for you, my flock, thus says the Lord God, I shall judge between sheep and sheep, between rams and goats. Is it not enough for you to feed on the good pasture? but you must tread down with your feet the rest of your pasture? When you drink of clear water, must you foul the rest with your feet? And must my sheep eat what you have trodden with your feet and drink what you have fouled with your feet? Therefore, thus says the Lord God to them, I myself will judge between the fat sheep and the lean sheep. Because you pushed with flank and shoulder and butted at the weak animals with your horns until you scattered them far and wide, I will save my flock, and they shall no longer be ravaged, and I will judge between sheep and sheep. I will set up over them one shepherd, my servant David, and he shall feed them. He shall feed them and be their shepherd, and I, the Lord, will be their God, and my servant David shall be prince among them. I, the Lord, have spoken. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Hello, I'm Miss Sarah. And I'm Liberty and we're glad that you're here for the children's time today. Will you all say hello to my friend Liberty? Hello, Liberty. Now, Liberty is a church mouse, which means that Liberty lives in the church. Don't you, Liberty? I sure do. Liberty, can you tell us what you like about living at the church? What I like about living at the church is the endless places to explore, wonderful people to meet, and really delicious crumbs. They remind me that God is 
good. Liberty, can you show us some of your favorite places at the church? Yes, I can. I like playing with toys in preschool classroom. I like reading all the books. I like helping too. Just this week, I double checked that all of the advent boxes were packed correctly and I helped answer the phone. But my favorite place is in the sanctuary because I love when Dr. Ed plays the organ and because there is a wood carving of my great grandpa Calvin. Well, Liberty, it's probably been pretty quiet around here. What do you miss the most? I miss hearing all the people sing and tell stories about God's love. God's love for them and for their neighbors. But I know that everyone is still telling stories and singing songs about God's love at home, but nobody has gotten me a Zoom account yet. So I think I am going to have to go visit people at their homes to hear their stories and see God's love at work. You're gonna go visit them at their houses? I'm going via the U.S. Post Office. Well, that sounds like quite an adventure, but it also sounds like a lot of fun. Maybe I'll come to your house, too. Look in your mailbox for an envelope from the church that contains Liberty, the church mouse. While Liberty is visiting with you, you can read your favorite books. You can show pictures of your grandma and your great, great, great grandma and share with Liberty some of your favorite things. Well, Liberty, it was so nice to have you here visiting. It was great to visit and I'm excited to go to all the kids' houses next. You all are some of my favorite people. I love the way you care for others, joyfully play games, listen to everyone's stories, reflect God's love, and I miss praying with you all. Can we pray together now? Absolutely. Well, we would all love to hear about your adventures with Liberty, so make sure you fill out a postcard and send it back in so that we can hear all about your adventures together. I love a good adventure. Yes, let's pray together. Dear God, thank you that your love is always with us. And thank you that your love is always with our friends and our family. Thank you that your love is bigger than we could ever imagine. Amen.
Friends, today is Christ the King Sunday. It is the last Sunday of our liturgical year. As I indicated earlier, tomorrow, not next Sunday rather, is our first Sunday of Advent, the start of a new year and a season of anticipation as we wait in joyful hope to celebrate the birth of our Savior, Jesus Christ. And so today's passages remind us of the sovereignty and power of Christ. Our lectionary passage for this morning comes to us from the Gospel of Matthew, the 25th chapter, verses 31 to 46. Listen to God's word. When the Son of Man comes in his glory and all the angels with him, then he will sit on his throne in glory. All the nations will be gathered before him, and he will separate people one from another, as a shepherd separates the sheep from the goats. And he will put the sheep at his right hand and the goats at the left. Then the king will say to those at his right hand, Come, you that are blessed by my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. For when I was hungry, you gave me food. When I was thirsty, you gave me something to drink. When I was a stranger, you welcomed me. When I was naked, you gave me clothing. When I was sick, you took care of me. When I was in prison, you visited me. Then the righteous will answer him, Lord, when was it that we saw you hungry and gave you food? Or thirsty and gave you something to drink? And when was it that we saw you a stranger and welcomed you? Or naked and gave you clothing? And when was it that we saw you sick or in prison and visited you? And the king will answer them, Truly I tell you, just as you did it to one of the least of these who are members of my family, you did it to me. Then he will say to those at his left hand, You that are accursed, depart from me into the eternal fire prepared for the devil and his angels. For when I was hungry, you gave me no food. I was thirsty, and you gave me nothing to drink. I was a stranger, and you did not welcome me. Naked, and you did not clothe me. Sick and in prison, and you did not visit me. Then they will answer, Lord, when was it that we saw you hungry or thirsty or a stranger or naked or sick or in prison and did not take care of you? Then he will answer them, Truly I tell you, just as you did not do, to one of the least of these, you did not do it to me. And these will go away into eternal punishment, but the righteous into eternal life. This is the word of God. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. Gracious and loving God, you draw near to us. Although we praise you on your throne in heaven. We are reminded that you in Christ are God with us, with us now, with us always. And so we pray that your presence will be made known. May the words of my mouth and the meditation on all of our hearts be acceptable to you, O God, for you are our rock and our redeemer. Amen. A few years ago, there was a contemporary parable that played out on social media. It was the story of a pastor who was newly or, uh, called to serve a large congregation. Well, on the first day of his ministry, he arrived to worship outside, disguised as someone who was homeless. He sat on the steps of the church and greeted folks who were entering the building, excited to meet their new pastor and worship God together. Not long after the last congregant was seated, this 
pastor walked down the center aisle and introduced himself from the pulpit, still in his disguise, letting the congregation know that he was, in fact, not someone who was homeless, but he was their new pastor and would be calling them to serve God in spirit and in truth, in word and in deed, and hoping that together they would open their eyes and their hearts to the needs of those around them. Well, upon further investigations, Snopes, um, the fact-checking website on the internet, called that story a fabrication. But to my surprise, Snopes noted several occasions when something similar actually happened in real life. In one instance, the pastor's daughter-in-law and daughter cut the pastor's hair and trimmed his beard while he was preaching from the pulpit in ragtag clothes and unkempt after he had lived for a week on the streets. In fact, the premise for this type of social and psychological and spiritual experiment originated as a psychology experiment at Princeton University in which psychology students put seminary students to the test. Seminary students were sent out into the world to complete an urgent assignment, yet on their way to complete the task, they encountered an actor who portrayed a person in distress with great need. Psychology students were nearby to note and examine if and how these seminary students stopped to help the one who was in distress exploring this ram these ramifications for life and ministry together. Now, I don't know about you, but tests of this nature make me shudder a little bit. Is there someone who's tracking my actions and my inactions? I can't help but go back through my memory to do the same type of fact-checking on myself and on my own behaviors. See, I want to live as a person of integrity, and of faith. I want to trust that my choices are going to place me in the company of sheep. Yet, if I were to be fully transparent, I am haunted by my inner goat. See, every time I think I've gotten it right, that I have fed the hungry or welcomed the outcast, I am reminded of a time when I have lived my best goat life a time when I failed to do the same. As Thanksgiving Day approaches, I am reminded of Thanksgiving of 1999. My husband and I were living in Chennai in India and decided to celebrate Thanksgiving by providing food for a family who lived on the street outside of a restaurant where we frequently ate our meals. Three generations of this family lived on woven plastic mats with a small cook stove and all of their possessions gathered in baskets and bags around them. Now, we would often visit with this family, sitting there and talking, following a meal. My husband would do magic tricks or juggle to entertain the children, and the grandma would often paint my hands with henna. Now, on this particular Thanksgiving day, there was no, there was a rickshaw strike, and so there was no transportation nearby that would allow my husband and I to go to the shop where we had planned to purchase huge bags of rice and lentils. So we set off on foot. Soon a man approached us, noting that we were foreigners, and began to tell us the story of his exile from his home country of Sri Lanka. He told us of the violence and oppression that he and his family had endured because of their Tamil ethnicity. We gave him some money and we listened to his story with compassion. Yet as we were seeking to give him our undivided attention, another man approached from the side. He got too close. He started begging, holding out his hand and saying, Ma, 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 seeking to get my attention. I ignored him. Couldn't he see that he was interrupting an important conversation? Couldn't he just wait his turn? Now he persisted to ask for help and to interrupt this conversation with this other needy stranger. And I was firm in my ability to ignore him. I confess at that time I was a little bit proud of my resolve. Eventually he got up and moved away. 
And it was only after he had gotten far enough away for me to see the entirety of his being without shifting my gaze that I noticed that he was a man who had been afflicted by leprosy. His hand and his foot had deteriorated. He used a cane to walk. His head was bandaged. He was truly the least of these, the most outcast of the outcast, those most sick, most unable to work. He was truly reliant on the compassion of strangers for his next meal, and I was crushed. Just when I thought I was being a sheep, I was being a goat. See, when we hear this passage this morning, it's hard for us not to do the math. It's hard for us to not step into the story and try to figure out where we might fall. Sometimes this passage might make us wish that there was, in fact, a universal naughty and nice list, and that with an internet search, we could quickly find where we might land and the action steps to make sure that our place as a sheep is embedded. We want to be counted a sheep. We want to be assured that we will land in the kingdom of God. We want to be patted on the back by God and told, well done, my good and faithful servant. Now, candidly, there is something to be said for this approach. Being convicted of our bad choices challenges us to do better. Cultivating a desire to belong as one of God's people can encourage us to seek out the ways where we might truly put that sense of belonging into action in community to form our world together, our life together, to reflect God's holiness. And as a mom of a three-year-old who is trying to make sure my child does not run out into traffic, a little dose of fear can be a compelling corrective. So a little fear of damnation might help us set our sights on the prize and veer our actions toward eternal reward. <clears throat> but frankly, friends, there are challenges if we stick with this approach of interpretation. See, if we focus on trying to establish our place among the sheep, in many ways, this approach supports the narcissism that this passage is trying to warn against. It places us at the center of the story. It emphasizes our own ability to focus on ourselves, to pick ourselves up from our bootstraps, <clears throat> to be saved by virtue of our own actions, our own choices, our worth, our identity as a sheep or a goat. It makes the story about us. And while good deeds and works of charity are essential to the life of faith, Centering ourselves in the story starts to tip the scales towards a model of works righteousness that Reformed theologians have warned against for centuries. See, we worship a God who has saved us by grace through faith. It is only by the grace of God poured out for us in the love of Christ Jesus that we have earned any eternal reward. <laughs> There is nothing we can do to assure our place in God's kingdom. There are not enough good deeds we could do to be counted as sheep. Now what's more, what's kind of interesting is that there are so many commentators who even suggest that this passage isn't about us at all. There are those who argue that this passage is an invitation, an open door in which God recognizes the righteous living of those who fall outside of the family of faith, those who believe in other gods, those who do not recognize Jesus as Messiah. They argue that, in fact, when Jesus is, that Jesus is, in fact, recognized in the least and the lowly. And that this is a passage of welcome in which God claims those outside of the church as sheep, saved by God's love. So what does this passage?
passage say to us? It is an important passage in our gospel. It marks the end of our liturgical year. And in fact, it is a gospel passage that has led us as a congregation and as a denomination to be identified as a Matthew 25 congregation. So what does this passage mean to us? What do we do? Well, today I would like to focus not on whether we fall in this story as sheep or goats. I would like to call our attention to the word that opens this passage, the word when. We hear this when throughout the passage. When the Son of Man comes in all his glory. When the Son of Man is surrounded by angels. When Christ is met or when Christ is not met in the least of his disciples. When. This is a word that seems to be a bit elusive in our current context. (coughs) Sentences of certainty like, oh, when I go to my mom's house for Thanksgiving dinner, I will get to eat her famous pumpkin pie in the softest chair at her dining table, have been replaced with more aspirational sentences like, when there's a vaccine that is safe and effective and available to everyone, I will be able to eat my mom's apple pie or pumpkin pie in her house with her again. There is no date attached, just a hoped for future. When has come to mark a time for which we are waiting when we can go all the way close to one another again, when the schools will be open, when we won't have to wear masks. But right now we live in an if world. If the numbers are down, maybe daycare will open again. If the weather is nice, maybe we can meet outside for a brief visit with our masks at a safe distance and see another person in the flesh who does not live in our own household. But if the weather is bad, we can do a drive-by parade for a birthday or a holiday, and we can wave through the glass that separates us and keep us safe. And so we mark our days with plans A through F, contingency upon contingency, trying to figure out how to navigate the ifs that mark our days. We wait for rulings on the day-to-day conditions of our lives, which seem to be ever-changing. And this is not only relegated to the context of a global pandemic. The same can be said when we think about um, the state of our election and the state of our nation as we await the certification of the results of the November 3rd election. There is so much that seems unsettled in our world. Our ability to adapt and adapt again and adapt again is being stretched. Anxiety is up energy is down. We need something to hold on to. And scripture gives us when. When we focus on this word, we see that our focus is directed to Jesus, the one who is our shepherd and who is our rock and who is our redeemer and who is our savior and who is our teacher and who is our friend. The when in this passage is Christ. In a sea of uncertainty and struggle and doubt, Christ is in our midst, not just an enthroned sovereign surrounded by angels, but today, here and now, located right in the midst of human frailty and vulnerability and suffering and need. The when introduced to us by Matthew is not just a hoped for time, but now. Today, Christ is with us. Among the hungry and the naked and the imprisoned and the ill, Christ is here in the world today, hidden in plain sight, even within us, in our imperfection and in our doubt and our worry and in our fear and in our coughs and our sneezes and our separation and our anxiety and our wounds and in our messiest version of the holidays we're trying to so beautifully 
engage in. In the midst of all that is confusing, Christ is here. When? Now. We might not recognize Jesus among us. We might not recognize Christ within us. But God is true to God's promises to be with us right now. And so Matthew extends an invitation to us. Then in a world bent on categorizing along lines of affiliations or associations that we see so clearly in this passage what we have been shown throughout all of the Gospels, and that is that Jesus identifies with the marginalized, with those who are hungry and naked and outcast and ill and imprisoned. And in searching for Christ, we then see those with whom Christ aligns. Our love for Christ attunes our hearts to love those Christ loves too. Friends, when we want to see Christ, we must look among those who have been told that they do not count. When we want to work with Christ, we need to prize what he values. When we want to encounter Christ, all that we have to do is shift our focus and spy Christ among those who are told that they don't matter and that maybe they never will. Among children in cages along the southern border of our nation, among black men and women and boys and girls who are gunned down with no warning, who too seldom receive any justice, among those battling addictions and afflictions, those who are barred from belonging because of their gender, their sexual identity, their ability, their ethnicity, their religion, or anything else that marks them, them. When we want to encounter Jesus, we need to look with eyes of love, shedding any pretense of elitism, and recognize that God is with all of God's people, especially those on the margins. See, the beauty of this passage is that it assures us of our unity with Christ. When we stop focusing on ourselves and look outward, shifting from the promotion of our own wants and focus on the needs of another, then when we shift from our own upward advancement and notice our own vulnerability and humility, when we shift from our own individual desire to be set apart and rather prize communion with others, especially those who are ignored or not like us or who make us uncomfortable. It is here that we will see God. When? Now. See, friends, we can see Christ. We can claim this emphasis as individuals and as a congregation and focus our eyes to find Christ because he is in our midst. And as we end this liturgical year, we are reminded that when is now. That yes, Christ is here among us in our fears and our wounds and our limits. Christ is here among those whose hand we cannot hold, among those for whom we cannot serve food without wearing masks. Christ is here with those who we cannot visit because we need to maintain an appropriate, safe social distance. But Christ is here now calling us to love as Christ loved us. See, it is this love, this love that is present in the least and the lost and the lonely. It is this love that is power. It is this love that makes change in our world. It is this love that gives life, new life, abundant life for all God's people everywhere. 
Friends, may we give thanks that this is the God that we worship and serve. A God whose love for us is so strong and powerful that that same God put on flesh and dwelt among us. Taking on our vulnerability, taking on our suffering, taking on our uncertainty and our pain, taking on our questions and our cries, taking on our sin, taking on all within us that might relegate us to classification as a goat. Let us give thanks that God is with us and has claimed us as God's own. And may we go out and see Christ in others. Let this be our challenge and our charge. Let this be the way that we live out Christ's love. May it be so. Amen. Siblings in Christ, will you pray with me this morning? Gracious and loving God, it is our desire to be found worthy to be called your good sheep, people who are always ready to respond to the needs of others. We pray first and foremost for eyes that will see clearly, for open ears that we might hear, and for hearts that are always yearning to love neighbor as we love ourselves. Lord God, there are so many individuals and collective concerns on our hearts today. Many of those concerns are universal and discussed out loud, while others are private and may go unspoken. We commend all of them to you. Lord, we pray for healing and wholeness for everyone who has contracted COVID-19, for everyone who has received a diagnosis or is receiving treatment for cancer or cardiac care. We pray for everyone suffering any physical, emotional, or spiritual illness or disease today. We pray that you will restore their bodies, their minds, and their spirits. Lord, we pray for families and friends who have experienced the death of a loved one recently. Most especially today, we lift to you Larry and Linda in the death of his mother and Heather Lawrence and her family as they mourn the death of her sister, Christina. We pray, Lord God, that even as they mourn, they might find moments to cherish the memories of their dearly departed. Lord, we pray provision and security for the many people who are still unemployed or underemployed, for everyone that does not have the financial means to support themselves or their families. We lift our prayers for the many people who are working in jobs that put them in harm's way each day. We pray safety and health for people in the medical profession for first responders, for store clerks, educators, and refuge collectors. And we pray for our staff who ensure that our building is clean and sanitized each day, that as we enter into work, that we are safe and prayerfully do not contract any disease. Lord, we pray for everyone whose position is deemed essential. You are a God who is concerned and cares for the least of these. And you call us to be a Matthew 25 people. So, Lord God, we pray for all who are hungry and thirsty, for all who are physically or emotionally incarcerated. We pray for those who do not have adequate clothing or shelter from the oncoming cold weather. And we pray for everyone who is isolated, lonely, or in despair. And for families and friends who will not be able to gather together this year to celebrate Thanksgiving. Lord, we pray that you will keep all of us safe, even as we are attempting to do what is right to keep others healthy and safe as well. We pray for everyone who is victimized by systems or institutions, as we pray for people who suffer injustice, oppression, and marginalization. We pray for households, cities, rural communities, and countries where violence and war have become normalized. Lord, most of all, we pray that your peace, justice, reconciliation, healing, and health will rule and reign on earth and that we will learn to love one another regardless of our political, ideological, or theological differences. Bind us together, Lord God, that we might be a people of unity, the body of Christ, many expressions, yet the people of God. 
So, Lord, we pray all this as well as the prayers that remain on our hearts today in the name of your son and our savior who taught us to pray, saying, our father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors and lead us not into temptation for thine is the kingdom the power and the glory forever and ever and ever. These are our prayers today, Lord God. Amen. Good morning, ELPC. My name is Frank Bowerly. My wife Paula and I have been members of ELPC for roughly six years. I'd like to talk to you for a moment this morning about Open Hand Ministries. I come to you through my role as a member of the Board of Directors of OHM, representing ELPC as one of the founding churches. So what is Open Hand Ministries? It's a 501c3 nonprofit that began as a ministry of a handful of churches in the East Liberty area. Open Hand Ministries is currently focused on the Pittsburgh neighborhoods of Garfield and East Liberty, and we're committed to promoting justice in our communities and helping break the poverty cycle through home ownership. We recognize that it's not enough to simply place somebody in a home. We need to prepare these people from home ownership. We need to make sure that these people are financially literate, that their debts are being managed, that they have good credit, and that they know how to budget, and that generally that they're prepared to be a successful homeowner. And we need to make sure that this home is affordable through various methods, including grants and deferred mortgages, not simply by building houses that are low cost. It's not enough, though, to teach these people skills. We need to support these people as they learn and work to make this journey to home ownership. We've adopted a community-based approach using the Circles USA model, and our goal is to create a caring and responsive presence in the lives of these families to support them when they need support, to listen to them when they have issues. And lastly, as a as a part of this, we believe it's critical that this community spans socioeconomic boundaries, racial lines, and cultural differences. So what's going on with Open Hand Ministries right now? You know, as with many organizations, because of the pandemic, we've had to shut down much of the face-to-face -face interactions we've had. And even now, any direct interactions we have are fairly limited. It's been really difficult this year, especially in light of the devastation caused by the pandemic. Um, the community we serve includes some of the frontline and essential workers that have been hit the hardest, and that makes it really rough. We're doing everything we can to keep the community together and to help the people we serve as they navigate through these issues. Our first priority this year, though, was to replace our founding executive director, Michael Stanton. He announced to us that it was time for him to step down and um, agree to stay on until we find a, found a replacement. After an exhausting and time-consuming search, we were fortunate to find Wayne Younger to take the position. He's been on board since September and has just done an amazing job. In 2020, we've helped three families qualify for and move into renovated homes. The pandemic threw a real wrench into things, but thanks to the hard work and perseverance of staff, families, and the funding organizations, we were able to close on these houses. We've slowed down, obviously, on home renovation, but we're still doing some work. We've finished up work on a property in Garfield and are trying to close on it this month. We acquired earlier this year through some gifts of our transitional rental property in um, East Liberty and did some minor renovations on it before we had a family move into it. We've also started work on renovating another transitional rental property that we acquired a few years back and have done very little work on it. It's time to upgrade it. We're doing everything we can though in 2020 to stay connected with our families, whether through individual calls or through community calls. Um, Tamika Barrett has just done an amazing job in trying to hold this community together. Where are we going in 2021? We have some fairly ambitious goals this year. As necessary, we'll keep with virtual activities. It's important to keep the mission moving forward, but we'd like to do it safely. We want to work on and finish renovating two houses. For those that have helped in the past, we all know that there's a tremendous amount of work to be done when we work on a house. Typically, since we start with houses that have been neglected, it takes time and people to gut a house off and down to the studs and then to rebuild it to the level of quality that we believe is necessary. We will have a heavy emphasis this year on our circles community. We know that the community- So it's the Sunday before Thanksgiving. 
It's appropriate time to thank you for your support of our church and our ongoing ministries. To date, we've received just over 150 pledges from congregation members and families that it helps us prepare our budget for 2021. But if you haven't filled out a pledge card yet, we encourage you to do so. You can do it online or give us a call and we can mail you one. And that's a lot easier than following up by phone. So continue to support the pledge campaign for 2021 so that we can be prepared for what the new year's opportunities may be. We're also highlighting the giving tree. Through our mission committee, we are providing resources for families in need at Christmas time. We do this annually, and usually we've actually bought gifts for families, but because of the pandemic, it's more appropriate for us to simply buy gift cards. So again, you can go to the website at elpc.church, and you can then use the form there under Sign Up Genius to actually pick the number of gift cards you'd like to purchase. You can buy them for $25 or whatever value you wish. Or if you wanna simply purchase a gift card for Walmart or Target and mail it to the church, just make sure on the envelope you notify it that it's for the giving tree. Other than that, this is our time when we also request your ongoing offerings, your pledges and tithes. It's in that giving that we're able to honor our budget commitments to the mission groups of our community and our church. And it's by your generosity that the love of Christ goes beyond our walls and goes out into the community. So thank you for this season. Thank you for these gifts, pledges, and offerings. And may all that we do ever be to the glory of God revealed in Christ. Friends, as you go forth this day, know that God is with us now. Christ is already among us in the midst of our own vulnerability and our fears and our insecurities and our imperfections. Christ is in this world all around us, among those who are struggling and suffering, those who are on the margins, those who are outcast those who are ill or imprisoned or hungry or thirsty or naked or in need of a home. God is with us now. Christ is here all around. May our eyes be opened and our hearts be opened too that we might see Christ in our midst and that we might respond to God's gracious love for us by going out and loving others in Christ's name. Friends, as we celebrate the Thanksgiving holiday, know that I am thankful for each and every one of you. 
for the opportunity to continue to worship God together, even from afar. And I am thankful that God is with us always. May the blessing of our almighty God, creator, redeemer, and sustainer, rest and abide with you this day and always and give you peace. Go now to love and serve and enjoy our loving God. Amen.